to It's Your Future. I'm Ada Harton, Volunteer Resource Specialist for AISD. It's Your Future is a program for AISD students and others who want to learn more about specific career fields. People from all walks of life will be here to share some of their experiences with you on our program, and we hope that our guests will help you become more aware of what you can do now to plan for the kind of future you want. You know, it's nice to listen to people and how they shape their lives and how they made it. And listening to these people, we hope, will give you a better idea about planning your future. We have with us a very, very, very special person today. He is a communicator in all walks of life, and his name is Mr. Cactus Pryor. And thank you so much for coming it's My pleasure, Ada. My real name is Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor. Uh -huh. Oh, how about that? I know another Richard Pryor. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people do. And it gets a little confusing sometimes. <laughs> I have people call me up in the middle of the night and say, is this Richard Pryor? And I oh. say, yeah. And they say, well, say something dirty. <laughs> and, I, and I accommodate them. <laughs> I know you do. You're just as funny, if not funnier. And you've been in the business for quite some time, much, much longer than he has. Ada, um, this June, I celebrate my 40th anniversary of going to work oh, for KTBC Radio. It uh -huh. was then, it's now KLBJ Radio. Mm -hmm. And then I was the first face seen on television in Austin, Texas. That's oh, a my. horrible way to begin, but from <laughs> then on it had to be up, you see. Had to be an improvement. Mm -hmm. That was in 1952. 52, okay. And I've been um, entertaining and communicating ever since I can remember. My father had uh, the first motion picture theater here in Austin. Oh, really? It was a Grand Central Theater up on Congress Avenue. Oh. And my Uncle Wallace was a projectionist. And we weren't exactly a million dollar operation. Mm -hmm. We charged five and 15 cents to get in. <laughs> and the equipment would break down after each show. <laughs> and the kids would start whistling and yelling. And Uncle Wallace would stick his head through the projection booth and say, shut your damn mouth. It's, I'm trying to fix it. <laughs> Well, then Dad would put me up on the stage, had a little box stage in front of the screen, and say, entertain the audience until Uncle Wallace gets the equipment fixed. Mm -hmm. So I would tell jokes, and uh, I, I did an impersonation of, of female opera singers before my voice changed. And uh, I would do that and, and give uh, the list of coming attractions and oh. stretch, you know, until Uncle Wallace got the equipment fixed, and then on we'd go. It's wonderful. So you started out way back then. Yeah, through the process of osmosis, really, because my father was a vaudevillian. He was a song and dance man. Oh. And um, first thing I can remember my grandmother doing is putting on a silly hat and making funny faces. Oh. And uh, you, you just kind of observe that. I have mm -hmm. four children, and one of them, um, my son Paul, yes. does the morning shift on oh. KLBJ radio, and then oh. is also in the after dinner business speaking. Oh now. Right. My daughter Carrie and her husband have their own band. She's a singer. And my son Don is a drummer in a band. Oh my goodness. And the only one who's not in show business is my son Dane, who's a policeman, but he's a radio dispatcher and talks <laughs> on the microphone. <laughs> oh, so. is that who, they, who's, who they're talking to each morning? What's his well, name? he's in Westlake Police. Oh, he's in Westlake yeah. Police. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Because I listen to Paul and Jeannie every morning. Yeah, and the way mess. he really ribs her, I tell you, I don't know why she stays on Paul the is the original male chauvinist. <laughs> he really is. <laughs> I think so, too, but he's really funny and he's really good. See, he's all the good. kids, all of my kids were literally born on the microphone because I was wow. doing my show from my home yes, when right. they were born. Mm -hmm. And then I would incorporate them into the commercials and they would help me with the commercials and with the broadcast. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, they, they literally grew up with, with the microphone in front of their mouths. That's wonderful, and I guess that's why they're so successful in that right now. Yeah, well, they don't know nothing else, you see. <laughs> Poor little things. <laughs> you didn't teach them anything else other than the radio or the communication field. I told all of my kids to do what you want to do, mm -hmm. uh, because you're going to be spending most of your life mm -hmm. at your work. You do. You spend eight hours a day mm -hmm. at your work. You spend how many with your family? maybe awake with your family, maybe three or four hours a day, oh. and the rest of the time sleeping. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important to enjoy what you're doing in your work. And I told all my kids that, and they mm -hmm. took it literally, very <laughs> literally, because they all like show business. Oh, and, and that's what I've done. I, I do what I like to do, and I enjoy my work. I'll never still, retire. And you're still doing that, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Forty years later. 
I did a show with Bob Hope the other night in, in oh, Dallas. Oh, tell us about and it. And it was a revival of vaudeville. Oh, yeah. And it had been 57 years since Bob Hope had been on the stage oh, of the, really? the Majestic Theater in oh, Dallas. Okay. And it was a very important stepping stone to his career mm -hmm. because from there, uh, a booker saw him and booked him in New York, and that was really the beginning oh. of his career. Mm -hmm. And Hope is 81 years <laughs> old, and he's doing oh. four shows a week oh, all over the goodness. country. We started rehearsing at 1. We went, went on at uh, 8.15. Mm -hmm. Show was supposed to be over at 10.15. 11.15, we were still trying to get him off stage. Oh. <laughs> we go to a party afterwards at 1.30. Here comes Hope still telling mm -hmm. jokes. Mm -hmm. Well, I asked him, I said, why do you do this? Mm -hmm. He says, are you kidding? Didn't you hear that audience? <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, why are you doing it? I said, well, I heard the same you heard audience. the same one. He's not going to stop. And it, uh, he loves his work. And uh, his work, in many ways, is his life. Mm -hmm. And he loves being with people and communicating with people and entertaining people. That's great. And you must do the two. You must enjoy that an awful lot. Oh, yeah. I think, like you say, you have to love your work in order to be able to be successful in it. Mm -hmm. And you've done such a neat job. I want to find out, too, from you. Where do you get your ideas to write the uh, cactus comments? I hear those in, in the mornings before I go to work, and I just, I'm always amazed. And you talked about um, Bob Hope on one of your cactus comments about a couple of weeks ago. Right. But uh, where, do you, where do you write uh, your material? How do you come up with that? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, my column is syndicated by the Dallas Times Herald, so I've got two deadlines oh. a week. And I have to turn my columns in on Monday and on Thursdays. Mm -hmm. And some newspapers run them uh, in total. Mm -hmm. And other newspapers, like the Austin American, cuts them up so there's a little, little bit every day mm -hmm. across the board. First thing I do when I get up in the morning is to get the newspapers and go through them and just scribble ideas on the newspapers. And then I'm driving to work and I hear something on the radio. That, but it all pertains to news. Mm -hmm. um, topical news, and I'll hear a remark on the radio and say, hey, that's an idea, and, and I'll write it down on my <laughs> palm of my hand, or I, I write on napkins, I write on dollar bills, <laughs> if I have a dollar bill. Mm -hmm. And then um, every Monday and Thursday I come to my office and uh, I set out the typewriter and take all of these pieces and put them together and try to make 12 or 13 gags. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's about 26 gags, and that's what really they are, they're gags a week. So wonderful. And, uh, so wonderful. I really enjoy doing it. <laughs> but it. And I like it because it's discipline. I have to do it <laughs> because I have those two deadlines. Right. And that's yeah. how I work with the, right. with the deadline <laughs> when I have to do it. I think they were just really great. And uh, the one about, oh, what the heck, I'm going to go and drink water. You know, you talked about all the things that are not good for you. And then after a while, there was just nothing left. Oh, you're talking about my radio commentaries yes, now? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Those are the ones I like. Yeah, that's a daily deadline mm -hmm. because I, I do the, oh, really? the commentary on KLBJ Radio every week, uh, every day of the week. Okay. And there, again, you look for ideas, and sometimes you just sit down at the typewriter and say, Lord, put some smart into my fingers. <laughs> Hit me with something, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and he uh, does, huh? Nice. But it's... It is really therapy also because mm -hmm. it gives you a, an outlet for your feelings, mm -hmm. sometimes for your anger. Mm -hmm. I did one recently. I was driving out to 2244, mm -hmm. Bee Cave Road that goes on to 74, and I see two billboards in this oh, most yeah. scenic drive in yeah. Central Texas. Yeah. Really angered me. Then I drive a little further, and there is a hill that I've been enjoying all of my life. Mm -hmm. sliced in half, right. fenced in, and now holding heavy machinery mm -hmm. that sliced the hill in, in half. And I started checking mm -hmm. up on it and discovered that it was the city of Austin that had done it. And it's going to be a power substation there, mm -hmm. electrical substation. Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, rather than just being angry with it and keeping all of the anger inside, I sat down and wrote my commentary on it, shared mm -hmm. my anger with other people right. who also reacted, and those billboards coming down. Oh, really? Power station will be that. there. I heard that commentary, and I but, thought it uh, was very, very good. Hmm. So you get material from wherever you see it. I try oh. to see humor in everything, mm -hmm. because I, I, I'm inclined to see humor mm -hmm. in most situations. And I think humor 
is a very effective form of communication. You can mm -hmm. say thing with, things with humor and get away with it that you couldn't say if you were saying it uh, <laughs> right. with just plain right, anger. Right, right. What do you think about all of the um, industry coming in and all of the um, changes that are happening here? Mm -hmm. What do you think about all that? Well, I'm right. ambivalent about it. Uh, mm -hmm. I have mixed emotions. Uh, having lived in Austin all of my right. life, having been born here, my grandfather helped put the lady on top of the Capitol. Oh, really? Um, you hate to see the natural setting mm -hmm. diminish and the tranquility and serenity of a smaller community. On the other hand, you love to see the economic growth so that your children have a better chance of making a living here and staying here. Mm -hmm. You like to see the better restaurants, the better entertainment, better clothes that, that mm -hmm. come with this. And uh, hopefully lower taxes by a broader corporation tax base. Mm -hmm. So you're really ambivalent about it. I, I become very angry by some of the things they're doing to our land. Mm -hmm. I wrote a piece on the polluting of Barton Springs from my early morning commentary, radio mm -hmm. commentary. Mm -hmm. J. Frank Doby was an ardent Barton Springsite. He would go there and uh, sit on the rocks and talk with whomever. Mm -hmm. J. Frank Doby was a great folklorist and teacher at the University of Texas. Yeah. And um, broadcast it as Doby would have delivered it. And we got such a positive response to it that that planted another seed. And I decided that I should recreate J. Frank Doby. Oh. John Henry Falk was his protege. Then John Henry and I got together and wrote a play, mm -hmm. a conversation between J. Frank Doby and John Henry Falk. Oh. And then we presented it and uh, at the Austin Opera House and had yes. 1,600 people. Oh, my God. And uh, then Conrad Ricketts produced it for videotape. And uh, now we have a two-hour show that we hope will be seen all over the world. Mm -hmm. So, you you know, they're, they're little seeds that come to you wherever, and yeah. you, you plant them and hope that they will bear fruit. <laughs> And they've bared quite a few uh, pieces of fruit for you. I understand that you have been in some movies or a movie, have you not? Uh, yeah, I've been in, I guess, several? about four or five. Uh, the best opportunity, movie-wise, was I emceed a dinner honoring John Wayne in, in Dallas one time. Oh, yeah. And I said, I'm going to see what this guy's made out of. So I really <laughs> kidded the pants off of him. <laughs> and rather courageously, I thought, because <laughs> he's a big guy. Uh, and he liked it. And six weeks later, I got a call from Wayne himself asking oh. me to play a, a sergeant in his movie, The oh. Green Berets, which was being shot oh. down in uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. Mm -hmm. So I went down, and he was also directing the movie. Oh. And I had six weeks of working with John Wayne. I also write, wrote some of the gags for the movie. He would. So, hey, this scene's not playing. <laughs> prior, prior, and then call me up and say, write me a gag for this. So I'd write them on toilet paper or napkin or whatever, just like my morning columns. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he invited me to uh, to be in the movie The Hellfighters with him. Oh, that's And uh, cameo roles, they call them. You know what cameo means? No. Very small. <laughs> <laughs> like the one I just had. Very, very small. Yeah. Yeah. Movie, movies bore me, generally. Oh. Um, why is that? Such a slow tempo. Oh, okay. if, we, if we shot two minutes of the film in one day, that was a good day shooting. There's so much preparation. And, right. you know, being in television as you are in radio, we're used to right. like this. You know? <laughs> and, uh, it's quite different. It's really not my tempo. It's quite different. Mm -hmm. So you prefer television or radio over that of movie? Yeah, unless I could be really deeply involved in the movie, then I think I would enjoy it. But I don't I like just sitting around. I see. So, tell me then, <clears throat> since you're in the, all the communication areas and what have you, um, and you started out with your father at the, at the uh, theater, mm -hmm. did you have any kind of uh, really specialized training, like educational background in communication, or, mm -hmm. or did it just happen to be natural? Well, I realize now that I was being trained all my life. When I saw my grandmother put on the silly hat and make a funny face, that was mm -hmm. education. Right. Uh, when I would, one of my first memories of my dad was going to Baker School, um, even before I was in the first grade, and watching mm -hmm. dad entertain 
the, mm -hmm. the pupils at a PTA benefit. Mm -hmm. I can even remember one of the gags that he told. I can literally remember it. <laughs> had a geography teacher named Mrs. Hall, mm -hmm. and um, she was pretty geographic in her size, too. She covered a couple of counties. She's a big gal. <laughs> Loved to eat. And Dad said, Mrs. Hall said that she would give half her life for watermelon. So I went out and bought her two. <laughs> and I can remember that for some strange reason. And it made an impression on That was part of my training as a comedian. But uh, school, uh, well, here at Austin High, where we're filming this, mm -hmm. I was president of the Glee Club, which is a oh. form of performing. Mm -hmm. I led all of the sing songs on the, at, uh, at um, seminar, seminars, what do you call it when they take a uh, break? Uh, assemblies. 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 Uh -huh. And I would try out jokes there. Oh, yeah. I was a member of the Red Dragons, which was a drama group. Uh -huh. So I got a lot of education from so. participation. When I went on to the university, I emceed the Aqua Festival. Oh, yeah. I appeared in Time Staggers On, which is a, an annual review. The Cowboy Minstrels, I would usually emcee. These were extracurricular activities, but they were mm -hmm. also part of school. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took every course in school that I thought would equip me to, to be an entertainer or communicator. Journalism was very mm -hmm. important to me. Mm -hmm. Speech, drama, mm -hmm. music appreciation, voice, singing, all of these things. and. Uh, and I've got to admit, I was a very poor student, mm -hmm. but I was very good in the subjects that did. interested me. Oh. I made A's in those subjects. In the rest, oh. I made F's or D's. Or <laughs> if the teacher was benevolent <laughs> enough, a C minus. <laughs> but again, it, uh, those are the ones that, like you say, that you were interested in, and those are the ones that uh, uh, have led you into the area of which you're in now. Yeah, so and in retrospect, I can see the value of concentrating on those courses that don't interest you too. Right. Uh, because I had to spend a lot of time reading, teaching myself mm -hmm. after I got out of school, correct grammar, for example, and spelling mm -hmm. and uh, uh, geography <coughs> and the other courses that I neglected. Well, I think that's just absolutely wonderful, you know. A lot of times you don't necessarily have to have the real formal training to be able to become uh, uh, an actor like right. you have. I know I never had a real formal acting class mm -hmm. and uh, it's worked out. And part of your education is watching uh, and I think this is a natural way as far as my business is concerned. Uh, had the pleasure to go to Bob Hope and personally tell him the other mm -hmm. day what a profound influence <laughs> it had upon my life because mm -hmm. I watched him, I watched his style, mm -hmm. the way he forms his gags and uh, and thanked him for being such a, a factor in my life. <laughs> I'm reminded of the time that uh, the one, if you want to know the most embarrassing moment of my life. Was I a factor? <laughs> yes. Was it really? What did I do? <laughs> <clears throat> I was working at the Headliners uh -huh. <clears throat> Club and I got off the elevator and I was so excited, you know, about working there because it's such a neat place and I really enjoyed it. And I, when, I got, when I got off the elevator, there was this person. And I said, oh my God, there's Bob Hope. And it was you. And you said, <laughs> he said, no, I'm not Bob Hope. He said something like, but I wish I had his pocketbook or something. I like wish that, my Bob. banker thought that. <laughs> <laughs> you, that you're very good at what you do. Thank you. And I'm, I'm a professional interviewer. I've been interviewing all my life. And you're, you're one of the good ones. Well, thank you. And you're good because you, you really listen to what a person is saying. I've been interviewed by, I can't tell you how many people. <laughs> who would ask me a question, I'd give him an answer. Ten minutes later, ask me that same question again <laughs> because they hadn't heard the answer before. Oh, well. And you get involved with your guest, and that's important. Well, I kind of like, uh, we try to keep the show very informal, but get the information over so that students will be able to understand what mm -hmm. we're trying to tell them. And uh, I feel that uh, being open and um, communicating with people is really going to be the only way you're going to learn anyway. Mm -hmm. if, be here on the stage or in the classroom. If you're not open for learning, then you're not going to be successful. I have learned so much at being on this show. Mm -hmm. Sure you have. All these people, you know, that I have interviewed, and they've taught me an awful lot. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you like me? I don't like to, I don't like to talk to my guests very much before we go on the air. Mm -hmm. 
because then there, there's a tendency for it to be uh, like rehearsed. Uh, and I like it to be a natural flow, uh, to natural conversation. And that's why I like to hit them pretty much cold turkey, do some research on them, bone up on them, but, but let it flow. Right, I, I, I agree. Um, I guess by the fact that hearing you on TV, on radio in the mornings, let me know an awful lot about you. Mm -hmm. And again, when I worked at the headlines, I had an opportunity to get to know you. So yeah. I know about you. I keep up with you. <laughs> I'm hard to avoid. <laughs> <laughs> You're really funny, though, that's for sure. Listen, let me ask you some things about volunteer, mm -hmm. okay? Um, tell me some of the volunteer activities that you might be involved with or organization. Have you ever did any volunteer work for the school district? Oh, yeah. I know you have. Yeah. What are some of the things? And, well, that's, that's uh, part of my job, really. My, my official title is um, Vice President of Community Affairs for the okay. LBJ Company. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> but that's just a title. It's, it's been a way of life with, with us in, in uh, radio and television mm -hmm. uh, ever since I could remember. Uh, because part of your obligation to the community as a member of a radio station, is mm -hmm. to serve the public. Right. And that is uh, so written in, in, in the bylaws that, uh, of the Federal Communication Commission. When you're granted a license for a radio or television station, you must swear to serve the, the public. Didn't know that. But um, working for Lady Bird Johnson, mm -hmm. it became not an obligation, but a way of life, one of the blessings of life, because you know all that she's done for the, for the oh, public and yes. continues to oh, do. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you absorb that and uh, so you do it. But I've, I've been involved in almost everything that is to be involved in, in the community. I'm, I'm honorary chairman of the Cancer Crusade right now, I think. Mm -hmm. I believe I am. <laughs> and, uh, You're not sure of that? No. I, yeah, I am. Yeah. And uh, just a bunch of other things. It must be exciting to work for for Lady Bird, uh, mm -hmm. you knew the president, and I understand that you did a lot of um, what MC commentating. For yeah, I, I emceed all of their right. functions at the uh, the LBJ Ranch. Well, back when he was a congressman, mm -hmm. through through his presidency, and had the opportunity to chop in some real tall cotton, oh. and to meet some very important people, and to to present them. Mm -hmm. The Johnsons were very very generous in sharing the presidency with the people. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could have brought in Bob Hope, or they could have brought in whomever they wanted, but they, uh, they allowed me to do it, and they allowed uh, local musicians to perform, mm -hmm. and local dancers to dance, uh, local caterers to cater. Mm -hmm. And uh, they kept it down home, and I appreciated that. Sounds so exciting. And they were, um, I had an opportunity to meet him. Again, this is from the Headliners uh -huh. Club, and I thought that was one of the most uh, <clears throat> enjoyable moments for me yeah. to enjoy. Tell me, you, have you ever had any disappointments in your life? One who, has, who is so hum humorous, I cannot even imagine you ever even having any kind of disappointments in any respect, but if you have... What time is it? <laughs> Fifteen <laughs> minutes ago. You that long. <laughs> sure you have disappointment. That's part of life. But how do you handle those? Badly. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. Well, let me give you an example. Okay. Uh, Phyllis George, who was Miss America, mm -hmm. married the governor of Kentucky, George Brown. Mm -hmm. And she invited me up to MC the gala that preceded the inauguration. And then I was going to be a personal guest at the inauguration that only be about 20 people. I'd done mm -hmm. some shows with Phyllis before. We were friends. So I wanted to do a especially good job. On the program also were Andy Williams, oh. uh, Foster Brooks, oh, yeah. Muhammad Ali, oh. and Lee Majors, wow. and a 35-piece orchestra, and I was the MC. So I called Phyllis's secretary, and I said, I want all of the inside information you can give me on Kentucky politics and personalities on Phyllis and her husband. And I worked for two weeks writing my material. And they introduced me, and I delivered my material, and they ain't laughed yet. <laughs> I fell flat on my face. The material was so inside, the people didn't understand it. 
And it was a very serious mistake. I should have gone with proven material that I knew would work. It's a good lesson for me, oh, speaking yeah. of learning. Um, but I was so injured. I had a special limousine assigned to me. I walked three miles through a sleet storm back to my hotel. I didn't go to the inauguration. That was four years ago, and I'm still hurting. <laughs> I'm still hurting. I'm sorry I asked you that. Yeah. Well, you asked, and I'm going to bleed. <laughs> Uh, well, <laughs> those are the defeats, but uh, the victories are much sweeter. Yes. But the right. victories, the defeats, they stay with you. Well, then, what was your most enjoyable accomplishment? We've got to put that one in, since you were so crushed about the other one. Yeah. I guess one okay. of the most enjoyable was um, I was asked to emcee the, the Washington Press Photographer's Banquet for President Johnson. Johnny Carson. Um, well, NBC was providing the entertainment. They had Sid mm -hmm. Caesar, Nancy Wilson, and the Step Brothers. So I wrote all of my material. Then the guy from Associated Press, Frank Comier, calls and said, hey, I'm awfully sorry, but NBC says they're not going to provide the entertainment unless we let Johnny Carson MC." Mm -hmm. I said, well, sure, invite me some other time. Oh. He said, no, we want you on the program. And what we want you to do is, after the dinner, present a rocking chair on behalf of the organization mm -hmm. to Vice President Humphrey. But take about 15 minutes to do it do some of your gags. So I did, and Humphrey was a great wit. Mm -hmm. And we, we jibe, we jail, and we swung. We, we had him in the aisles for 15 minutes. And really just a great reaction. Oh, wonderful. Carson came on as MC after the show, had not listened to what we had done, and was using basically the same subject matter and fell flat on his face. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> Rather sadistically, that was one of the great, <laughs> great experiences that I had. I bet. I bet yeah. you, could, you really did enjoy that, yeah. did you? Well, listen, I tell you, I don't know where the time went, but it's gone almost. Yeah. And I'd like to ask you one last question. That is, what would be your advice to youngsters who may be looking at the communication field as an area to go into, what do you think? Well, look at it and take a, take a good look at it. See all that you can of it, and, and not just the glamorous side, but the... Uh, the nitty-gritty side, and um, come and watch shows like this being made. Talk to people like you, talk to people like me who've been in it, and mm -hmm. really study it. Make sure you like it before you go into it. Okay, and that would be your advice. And do your homework. <laughs> and do your homework. <laughs> well, we certainly do appreciate you coming by. And Thank you for having me. And visiting with us, just wonderful. And uh, I know that our youngsters, um, have benefited by your being here, and we want to remind them that listening to uh, Cactus alias Richard Pryor <laughs> this morning has certainly been delightful for me. And we want to remind you that um, regardless of what area you want to go into as a career to pursue, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be very hard work sometimes, but it's worth it because it's your future. Thank you. <laughs>